Good morning and good afternoon and welcome to the February 2023 WASD webinar. My name is Stephanie Carpenter with DTN, your moderator, and with me today is Todd Holtman, Lead Market Analyst for DTN. During this event, all participants will be in a listen-only mode, but you can ask questions at any time during the event. To do this, click the Q&A section located on the bottom right of your screen to open the Q&A panel, and from there, type in your question in the box at the bottom and click the Send button. We encourage you to ask questions at any time during this presentation, and your questions will not be viewable by other attendees and will be addressed during the Q&A session at the end of this presentation. Also, this event is being recorded and a rebroadcast link will be on our DTN website within 48 hours. And as a reminder, our web address is DTN.com. We're ready to start the webinar, so I will turn it over to Todd. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining in today. We're going to be taking a look, as Stephanie said, at the WASD report for February. This typically is not uh, a big market moving type of a report, but we do have uh, attention, uh, increased attention, I should say, on South American crop estimates as we're just starting to see the Brazilian crop uh, get, get harvested uh, at this current time. And there's been a lot of excitement in the weather, which uh, we'll talk about. So here we are, USDA turns attention south in February. Let's get started with what USDA said for today. And of course, as usual, we're gonna start with corn. And here's the US balance sheet uh, for corn. And the far right column there is where you see today's new February estimates. There's really only one change to talk about. That's the ethanol uh, demand. Uh, for corn, and that was reduced by 25 million bushels by USDA. We'll talk about that a little further as we get into the details, uh, but I would say it's not overly surprising. Maybe it was a little surprising that we saw no change in the export estimate as corn exports continue to uh, lag pretty severely their pace from a year ago. Keep in mind, uh, I don't think it's unreasonable that USDA kept the export estimate unchanged today because we still have uh, corn's best opportunities still in front of us, at least before Brazil's next corn harvest, uh, which normally takes place in July. So with that one change uh, in the 25 million bushel reduction in ethanol, the new ending stocks estimate for corn you see in the red rectangle box there is 1.267 billion bushels. That's just slightly higher uh, than what we saw a month ago. It's still the second lowest ending stocks total for corn in the past nine years. So this is really still relatively a tight supply situation for U.S. corn. And of course, that's being experienced most dramatically out in the Western Corn Belt. Uh, USDA's average farm price estimate stayed the same, $6.70 a bushel. Here, uh, we're just starting the sixth month of the season. so that estimate is starting to get pretty well established uh, by now already. Now we'll take a look at the world estimates for corn from USDA today. And here we see, if you look at the uh, upper right-hand corner, the new ending stocks estimate for the world corn total was reduced slightly from 296.4 to 295.3 million metric tons. That's not uh, a big change in the figures at all. It uh, equates to 3.46 billion bushels, and that's uh, still, well, excuse me, um, if, if you look at the two numbers below that, where we exclude China from the ending stocks total, we also see a, a small reduction from 89.1 to just under 88 million metric tons. That comes to 3.46 billion bushels. And that is the second lowest total in 10 years. Of course, we exclude China because, uh, first of all, I think it's uh, ridiculous to think that China has 8 billion bushels of corn surplus uh, when they've been an active uh, importer, obviously, the past couple of years. That just doesn't jive. Uh, but also, China is not a big exporter of corn uh, uh, in, by any means. And uh, so this, whatever supply China does have, isn't really available to the world market. So. That's why I continue to focus on that uh, ending stocks figure, which excludes China, and I think is more representative of world corn supplies. A couple other things to note on this world uh, balance sheet before we move on. Uh, we're interested, of course, in USDA's estimates of the South American crops. 
You'll see that in the second column under the production totals in the green rectangle. And here we see the only change for the day was in Argentina. That crop estimate reduced from 52 to 47 million metric tons. That was pretty much in line with expectations of slightly less than the Dow Jones survey's estimate of 48 million metric tons, but uh, in the ballpark of what most people were expecting. Uh, if true, that will be the lowest our, uh, production out of Argentina in the past five years. Uh, and of course, uh, that crop is still developing uh, so that estimate remains in flux. This week, uh, the, the forecast has been hot and dry for the most part. Argentina does have some chance for rain this weekend, perhaps better chances uh, next week, but the overall pattern remains dry for Argentina crops, and that's why they continue to show low crop ratings in their uh, local assessments. For Brazil, uh, USDA's crop estimate stayed unchanged today at 125. A million metric tons. The new safrina crop, which is the largest uh, crop in Brazil, is uh, just being planted now. It's roughly 9% uh, planted, said Brazil's crop agency, CONAB, uh, just this morning. Uh, it's interesting that in Brazil, they're not expecting quite as large uh, a corn crop this year as uh, USDA is. Their estimates at 1237 million metric tons, but in the big picture, that's still a record crop for Brazil. So uh, the, the concern here uh, that we'll be watching is um, uh, just when does the rainy season end in Brazil? It hasn't stopped yet. Uh, that's one reason that uh, the soybean harvest and the corn planting activity has been uh, slower than normal uh, this year. And then how much of that corn crop will be exposed to the dry season? And of course, that's the question every year in Brazil. The last thing to look at uh, I want to draw your attention to is the little blue uh, square in the lower right corner. And there we see a change in Ukraine's uh, corn export estimate once again. You might remember in last month's report, we saw that estimate go up 3 million metric tons. USDA raised it another 2 million metric tons today to 22 and a half million metric tons. So it's quite interesting that the, the Black Sea Grain Initiative has proved much more successful than I ever expected personally, and I think uh, more successful than a lot of people expected. So USDA continues to increase uh, their export estimate uh, out of Ukraine. World corn supplies. Uh, this is what I was talking about, the uh, estimates of world ending corn stocks excluding China. This gives us a little history of that going back to 2010. You can see the red bar is the current uh, estimate today, 3.46 billion bushels. As I mentioned, it's the second lowest total in 10 years, but we've seen a gradual decline uh, over the last several years in the world's uh, corn surplus. And uh, of course, the Ukrainian war as well as uh, drought in the U.S. Uh, has added to that in the most recent year. The history of cash corn prices. Uh, this chart, uh, not to get too complicated with it, but basically we're asking uh, if we look back at previous times in history when USDA estimated a 9.1% ending stocks to use ratio, which is what today's estimate comes to, uh, what kind of cash prices did corn trade at at that time? And of course, I've had to factor this, uh, these past historical cash prices for uh, inflation. So it's a very general representation. And as you can see by the wide scatter of blue dots, which are the past prices, there's a lot of uh, variety and conditions that go into making a corn price, uh, even beyond just the ending stocks to use uh, ratio. So the correlation is not very high, but it does give us a bit of an expectation at least uh, historically speaking, and in this case, uh, we would normally expect a cash corn price around $5.80 a bushel. Now, currently, corn last night, DTN's National Corn Index of Cash Prices closed at $6.84, so that's obviously well above the uh, statistical expectation that we have here, and uh, I, I have to say, I think USDA's uh, ongoing average farm estimate is probably serving us better uh, at this time. But part of it is because the markets had such a big uh, dislocation. You know, we're, we're now trading in a much higher uh, input environment. Your fuel prices are much higher. Your fertilizer is much higher. 
we've had a big disruption uh, in the representation of corn prices. So I think uh, this this particular chart maybe is, is losing its effectiveness a bit in uh, helping us uh, get a, a, at least a, a general idea of what corn prices should be trading at. The corn basis continues to stand extremely strong, even though we have disappointing export pace right now and some potential problems in ethanol, which I'll talk about in a minute. The national corn base, uh, as seen by our DTN corn index, uh, is right now uh, closed last night, 10 cents above the March contract. And uh, this chart shows that that is well above uh, any basis level we've seen the past 20 years. You know, typically at this time of year, if we traded 10 cents below the March contract, that would be a good basis. But here we are 10 cents above. And of course, a lot of it has to do with the very tight supply situation that we have in the Western uh, Corn Belt. So uh, this this probably says a lot more about demand this year uh, than anything else I could show you. As far as the exports go, uh, here's, here's the bad news for corn demand this year. As of January 26, there's been 496 million bushels of corn shipped. That's down 36% from a year ago. The year ago pace is represented by the green shade on this chart. And right now we're at the red line with the, with the circle around it. Uh, as you can see, we're getting close to the point when uh, the pace of corn shipments tends to pick up. We're probably just two or three weeks away from when that uh, uh, seasonal change starts to take place. And as far as corn sales go, we should also have a better opportunity uh, between now and the end of June uh, when uh, our U.S. corn prices ought to look a little better in relation to everybody else. But uh, we, we just haven't gotten there yet. We haven't really turned the corner yet. Still have a, a very disappointing pace of corn export sales. Here's uh, the situation with the ethanol plants at the moment. Uh, if you heard this morning's Energy Department report, at last week's ethanol production dropped slightly to 1 million barrels uh, a day. Now, the overall pace of ethanol production since September is still slightly above last year's pace. Um, but I think the reason USDA reduced the ethanol uh, demand estimate by 25 million bushels is uh, simply largely out of concerns about the, what we're seeing in the plant margins uh, for ethanol prices and also the fact that we've seen gasoline demand uh, at a much lower level this year, down 6% since, since September. And that could be due to uh, a lot of things. It could be possibly slower economic activity, better fuel mileage overall, but also perhaps the uh, new electric vehicles are having a little bit of an inroad into gasoline demand. And that's a bit of a concern for the ethanol market. The blue line that you see on this chart is uh, USDA's estimated corn processing value. So when they take the corn to the ethanol plant, we total up the, pri the, the value of ethanol and the distiller's grains and the corn oil. And uh, last week's total came to $8.36. Now you subtract the DTN National Corn Index of 684, and you get a, a roughly estimated margin of $1.52. In the fall, that margin was closer to two to two and a half dollars, a much more encouraging scenario uh, for ethanol production at that time. But uh, it does seem to be having uh, some weakness again here early in 2023. The spec positions in corn, uh, it, it, if you heard, uh, we don't have the latest uh, data from the Commitments of Traders report because last Friday, the uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission announced that uh, the data the, the data they're working with, one of the third-party providers is having technical issues and they didn't want to put out any new numbers until they can validate and make sure that the numbers are correct. So, you know, I, I applaud them for uh, wanting to have the numbers right. Uh, in the first place, but the unfortunate thing is we don't have the latest numbers and we don't know how long it's going to be before uh, the, that commitment of traders report uh, is back again. So hopefully not too long, but the last time we uh, saw this report, specs were net long over 277,000 contracts uh, of corn. That's a heavy speculative position. 
uh, as it has been for uh, quite a while. But as you can see on the chart of March corn prices, we've been in a very narrow sideways range uh, ever since August between roughly six and a half dollars and seven dollars. And we don't seem to have any uh, urgency uh, about breaking out of that range anytime soon. So the, the large amount of speculators in the market is a bit of a concern if prices broke down for some reason. But uh, overall, I think prices have been protected by that very strong national cash basis we talked about earlier. Okay, let's take a look at soybeans, what USDA said today for soybeans. This is also going to be a, a very simple explanation. There is only one uh, factor changed on the balance sheet for U.S. soybeans, and uh, that is the crush estimate. Now, uh, that was reduced by 15 million bushels, a small amount, to 2.23 billion bushels. And if you've been following what I've been writing uh, for a long time about how good the crush incentives are, you might think, well, gee, it seems uh, odd. Why would USDA uh, reduce the crush estimate? But in fact, the crush uh, total, the crush activity, has been uh, slightly lower uh, than expected this year. I think we're down roughly 1% on pace with last year, uh, whereas the current crush estimate is still above the year ago pace. Now, why is it so slow? Uh, I, I have to think uh, that this really is a, another reflection of possibly very tight supplies of domestic soybeans because uh, when you look at the numbers, the, the demand for soybean meal and soybean oil is still uh, quite lucrative in comparison to the cost of soybeans. We've seen earnings reports from ADM and other soybean processors showing phenomenal results. So you think that they would just be crushing all the soybeans they could, and yet the actual crush total so far seems kind of uh, limited, maybe even slightly uh, disappointing. I'm a little concerned that that may uh, continue through summer, especially as our U.S. soybean totals tighten. We've had a very active pace of export demand, and uh, uh, even with today's higher ending stocks estimate, and by the way, it was increased from 210 to 225 million bushels, so uh, the 15 million bushel increase coming from that adjustment in the crush total, uh, we are still looking at an extremely tight situation of U.S. soybean supplies with not a lot of margin once again uh, this summer. So it's uh, still a tight situation here. I don't see any uh, reason to, to think otherwise just from today's report. USDA actually increased its average farm price from $14.20 to $14.30 uh, in today's report. The world estimate uh, for soybean supplies uh, from USDA was reduced slightly from 103.52 million metric tons down to 102.03 million metric tons, just a very minor uh, tweak lower on that. Uh, Dow Jones survey was estimating 101.6, so it came in a little higher than the total, but still it's a small reduction nonetheless. The attention uh, today, of course, are on the production estimates, which is that second column. Uh, with the green rectangle that you see. And we'll take a look at all three South American countries there. The only one being uh, adjusted today is Argentina's soybean crop. So drought once again is showing up in Argentina. And that estimate was reduced from 45 and a half million metric tons down to 41 million metric tons uh, for Argentina. That uh, comes out to 1.51 billion bushel uh, crop for Argentina. And like corn, if, if that holds true, it will be the lowest production from Argentina in five years. So continue to have very uh, tough situation with the uh, dry weather. And of course, that La Nina influence is still in effect, even though it's expected to turn neutral here uh, between now and April. The history of uh, cash soybeans uh, in this situation, the ending stocks to use ratio today with the slightly higher uh, ending stocks estimate is 5.2%. That is still historically a very tight situation. We don't have a whole lot of uh, previous years to compare to, but the historical target for a 5.2% ending stocks to use ratio comes to roughly 
uh, a bushel. Last night, BTN's National Soybean Index closed at $14.80. Uh, so whether you look at our target of $14 or USDA's average farm price of $14.30, I think uh, both of those are fairly close uh, in terms of expectation for what soybean prices should do in the year ahead. Of course, there is uh, plenty of uncertainty on the table and uh, there's gonna be plenty of attention on how the soybean prices come out. Oh, by the way, I just talked about Argentina. I should have also mentioned Brazil expecting still a record high soybean crop, 153 million metric tons. That did not change from last month's estimate from USDA. Although we did get a slight uh, increase from Brazil's crop agency CONAB this morning, they nudged their uh, soybean estimate up to 152.9. So uh, whether you look at CONAB or USDA, they're very close uh, in estimating this record soybean harvest uh, for Brazil, which uh, supposedly is roughly 9% uh, harvested at this uh, time and working through very wet conditions. And then the third country, Paraguay, which is kind of on the southern end of Brazil, uh, is uh, holding to its uh, crop estimate of 10 million metric tons. Uh, so far, no change from last month on that one. Okay. The cash soybean price just covered. Now I'm going to go to the next slide. Here we have the export pace for soybeans here, and here you see uh, a much more active pace than what we saw for corn. Uh, as of January 26, soybean exports total just over 1.3 billion bushels. That's down just 2% from last year's pace, which is the green shading on the, on the map. The current uh, uh, point in time is the red line is where we're at. We have so many export sales, soybean export sales on the books right now that we're actually, uh, as of uh, yesterday's report from the Census Bureau, we're actually within 191 million bushels of the export estimate for the entire year. Now we still have seven months ahead of us, and I don't think it's gonna be too difficult to get 191 million bushels of export sales, even with Brazil having its record crop. So this is uh, quite a bullish pace for soybean exports this year. Uh, last I checked, China's purchases of US soybeans uh, are up 14% from a year ago. And uh, frankly, most of those types of soybean sales to China have been shipped. There's not a lot left at risk here uh, in terms of possible cancellations. So the export pace uh, keeping up very well for the U.S. soybean market this year. The soybean basis, we've seen the soybean base slip lately, to be honest. Uh, as of last night, the cash basis was 35 cents below the March. I think when we talked about a month ago, it was about 10 cents uh, better uh, than that. So we have seen that soybean basis start, start to slip. But even at 35 cents below the Mars contract for this time of year, that's still the strongest uh, basis we've seen since 2013. And it's among the better basis opportunities uh, that we normally see in early February. Our DTN uh, soybean index closed at $14.80 last night. That was up 14 cents from when we talked about this a month ago. The U.S. crush continues to remain a very bullish feature of soybean demand, even with USDA's slight reduction today of 15 million bushels in the crush estimate. And this chart continues to show just how profitable that is. The blue line at the top is the value of soybean oil and soybean meal crushed from the soybeans, and that's based on the March futures price. Comes to $18.38 last night. And as you can see, that's just been gradually working higher uh, basically since fall. And of course, part of that's been supported by the problems in Argentina because Argentina is the world's largest exporter of meal and oil uh, from soybeans. So our problems in Argentina has just enhanced the crush value that we get from soybeans here in the US. The uh, black line is the March soybean price. That's obviously the, the input cost in this crush process, $15.15. So uh, you take off the cost from the crush value and you get $3.23 a bushel is uh, the, the gross of what processors are clearing 
from crushing soybeans. Now, uh, as I've mentioned before, if we looked any time before 2022, before renewable diesel started becoming a big bullish factor in the soybean market, we would normally see crush premiums of say a dollar and a half or maybe $2 if uh, conditions were good. But to see $3.23 holding up is uh, very impressive here and very good news for soybean processors that have turned in uh, some very good earnings reports thanks to these higher crush uh, premiums. So this continues to be, in my mind, a very strong source of support for the soybean supply. And as I say, I think the only thing that's really gonna possibly slow down this crush process this summer could be the tightness of the soybean supplies themselves. As far as the speculation uh, positions go, we saw a big washout of speculators from the long side of soybeans this summer, and that lasted mostly through the harvest period. But just in the last month or two, we've seen specs start to return again to the long side of the soybean market. Uh, as of the most recent uh, report on January 24th, we see specs net long over 155,000 contracts in soybeans. Typically, specs uh, respond to changes in trend, and we have seen uh, soybean prices trending gradually higher uh, since the fall harvest uh, period. And of course, uh, the publicity and news about Argentina struggling with drought uh, doesn't hurt as far as getting spec attention involved on the long side of the market. But somewhat similar to corn, those uh, bullish spec positions could be a concern uh, at some point, but um, I, I suspect we have uh, a few more months ahead of us uh, before um, prices are, are gonna be at any serious risk of, of breaking new lows, but we'll just have to see how the uh, early summer plays out. Okay, lastly, uh, let's take a look at wheat. What did USDA say in the February report for wheat? Uh, in this case, there were only two very slight tweaks uh, to the demand estimates for wheat. USDA reduced its estimate of wheat food demand by 2 million bushels and increased the estimate of seed demand by 1 million bushels. So it's almost not worth mentioning, but I just uh, need to explain how we get to a new ending stocks estimate of 568 million bushels this month instead of last month's 567 million bushels. Uh, if you notice, USDA did reduce the average farm price from $9.10 uh, to $9 uh, even, and uh, but uh, not a big change here in wheat as was expected. Uh, as far as the categories of wheat, there's really only a couple things to point out here, and that is in the soft red winter wheat category, we saw USDA increase that ending stocks estimate by 12 million bushels up to 102 million bushels. And uh, as, as you know, if you've been following our market comments, the, the, the winter conditions for the SRW wheat crop have been just very, very good. Uh, plenty of soil moisture, much better situation that we, than we saw in the fall. Um, a lot of soil moisture replenished uh, basically all the way from Arkansas throughout the eastern Midwest. I think eastern Michigan might be the only source of dry concern uh, at this time. It, the light wheat uh, um, ending stocks total was reduced. It's uh, often no surprise. We tend to have very good export demand for white wheat. That was reduced uh, as an ending stocks total from 56 to 45 million bushels. And then for the hard red winter wheat, we saw a slight reduction, 1 million bushels in the ending stocks estimate. Same thing for uh, Durham wheat. But basically, uh, the SRW crop and the white wheat uh, were the only significant changes here uh, in the category. But overall, there, as, you, uh, as I just mentioned, there's only a 1 million bushel difference in the ending stocks estimate for all the wheats. Uh, the attention today was more among the world ending wheat estimates, and that's what we'll take a look at here. We start in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, USDA's estimate of world ending wheat stocks increased slightly from 268.39 million metric tons up to 269.34. We'll talk about some of the uh, tweaks that made that happen. 
Of course, uh, similar to corn, I'm more interested in the ending stocks estimate where we exclude China. And in that same rectangle, we see a slight increase there from 124.3 up to 124.75. But as we'll see, that's still a very low total, historically speaking, for world ending wheat supplies. Now, uh, just to mention a couple uh, of the changes, there were only two crop estimates in today's report that changed. That's the two little red squares in the second column. We saw Australia's wheat crop estimate increase from 36.6 up to 38 million metric tons. Uh, we've been hearing about uh, good yields there, although there's been concerns about uh, quality of Australia's wheat, especially from Eastern Australia where um, uh, heavy rains hit at harvest time. And then in Russia, there was a slight increase in that estimate from 91 to 92. Now, if you know, there's <laughs> been a lot of talk about uh, why is USDA's wheat estimate for Russia so low compared to everybody else's up near 100 million metric tons uh, or more, but USDA for the most part sticking to its guns here, uh, just budging 1 million metric tons on that Russian estimate. The uh, export category I thought was fairly interesting. And you see that on the blue rectangle from the uh, second column to the right. And there we see uh, from Australia's crop estimate, we see a slight increase in the export estimate of wheat for Australia, a half million metric tons. Canada showed the only reduction of the day, uh, losing a million metric tons of export estimate in Canada. In the European Union, and Russia and Ukraine, we all see export estimate increases of a half million metric tons. So that's where most of the activity uh, has been this year as far as foreign wheat sales go, uh, European Union, Russia, and Ukraine, and USDA tweak those uh, a little bit higher once again. How do the world uh, wheat supplies look? Well, here's uh, that uh, metric excluding China that I talked about. USDA estimating 124.7 million metric tons comes out to 4.58 billion bushels. It shows up on this chart as the red bar and you can see the previous years. This is the lowest total estimated in 14 years, although there are uh, a few years in there where uh, we, could, we could say it was close. Uh, for instance, most notably, uh, 2012 to 13 uh, was very close to this year. And of course, in North America, that was remembered as a significant drought year. But this is just how tight the world uh, wheat ending stocks are. And of course, uh, the war in Ukraine continues to be a big problem and a big hindrance going forward for next year's production. The history of cash wheat prices. Here's a, a little different twist on trying to uh, give us an idea of what wheat should trade at. And that is, I take a look at uh, previous prices in relation to their cost of production. And the cost of production estimates come from USDA. In this situation, uh, for all wheat, all US wheat, uh, the ending stocks to use ratio is just under 30% of annual use. That's the lowest ending stocks to use ratio in nine years, uh, even though the U.S. actual ending stocks of wheat are the lowest in 15 years. So uh, we've seen some de demand decline, uh, which makes the difference there. Currently, last night's price of uh, our DTN index for HRW wheat came in at $8.57. That's roughly 15% above its estimated production cost. Now, for a commodity, uh, for wheat in particular, where we're looking at the lowest ending stocks to use ratio in nine years, to be trading only 15% above production cost uh, just doesn't match up with where prices normally trade when supplies uh, are that tight. So um, uh, I, ju I just wanted to uh, show this as a representative. I think, uh, Judging by uh, this valuation tool, uh, something closer to $9.50 or $10 would at least be, at a minimum, much more reasonable for the price of HRW wheat uh, in this situation. So I think it's going to be very interesting to, to uh, watch the wheat market the next four months as our U.S. supplies get tighter and tighter, just what happens to the price of wheat. And, of course, we're seeing wheat trade higher again today. We've seen more commercial buying interest on the long side of wheat 
uh, lately, and we're starting to see the March-May spread uh, widen out, which is another sign of commercial buying interest. So I think the fundamentals are finally uh, starting to show up and should have a good chance of uh, offering a higher wheat price here in the next four months. The basis uh, for HRW wheat has not been anything to uh, brag about lately. Uh, it's currently 28 cents below the March contract based on last night's price of $8.48. Um, so we, we are seeing an increase in the actual cash wheat HRW prices. And in fact, tonight's close uh, has a chance to be the highest cash close that we've seen in over two months. But the basis itself, is just a few cents below the five-year average. So uh, it'll be uh, interesting again, I think, to see if this basis doesn't improve as U.S. wheat supplies tighten the next few months. As far as the spec positions go in Kansas City wheat, I, I think they're just totally misdirected at this time. Uh, from the most recent report, we saw uh, that specs were net short over 8,000 contracts of Kansas City wheat. It's very dangerous for specs to be promising uh, to deliver wheat that they don't have. And uh, it's, I think they're going to find themselves in a bind here pretty soon, to be honest. And that also has a lot to do with, I think, the, the support that we're seeing coming off the lows and the increased uh, activity from the commercial side of the market. In Chicago wheat, it's an even more dangerous situation. Uh, the funds there are net short the equivalent of 369 million bushels of soft red winter wheat uh, in Chicago. And uh, obviously they don't have any wheat to deliver to the market. So they're gonna have to buy back that much at some point in time. And uh, it, you know, that's, that's a lot more, uh, that's even more wheat than the US produced uh, for soft red wheat uh, in 2022. So uh, I, I, don't, I honestly don't know what they're thinking, but they've got themselves in a tough bind and, uh, it just seems uh, very likely that we're going to have a short covering rally at some point ahead of us. In conclusion, uh, today's report, I have to say, is largely neutral for all three crops. The changes that we saw were very minor. In corn, 1.267 billion bushels of ending stocks was very close to estimates, um, uh, just almost exactly what the trade was looking for. The 225 million bushels of ending stocks and beans uh, were slightly higher than the trade expected, but it's still uh, among the lowest ending stocks levels in seven years. And uh, as far as uh, ending wheat stocks, we only had a 1 million bushel uh, change. So that's about as neutral uh, as it gets. So that wraps up the report for today. Stephanie, do you have any questions for us? There are actually no questions from the audience today, which means you've covered everything perfectly. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but fair enough. Great, thank you. And I'd also like to thank everyone for joining the webinar today. As a reminder, today's event has been recorded and the rebroadcast link will be up on dtn.com slash wasd-webinars within 48 hours. Also, if you have any additional questions or would like more information regarding our topics today, you can see Todd's contact information listed here on the screen. This concludes our event. Thanks for joining and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.